So what I'm going to be addressing is uh, low carb and the myths that refuse to die. So most dietary guidelines, as you know, are focused basically on reduction of sat, spe fat, especially saturated fat. But they are very liberal with carbs, especially grains. They actually push you to eat more of them. So this very carb-centric approach is obviously not helping. You just look around. Uh, we have an epidemic of obesity, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes. And there is no shortage of high-quality studies, just as Nina Teichos was saying uh, before me, uh, that a low-carb approach is effective. And yet, it struggles to be accepted by the mainstream. So the question is, why there is so much resistance to a low-carb approach? Uh, the current guidelines were develop, developed with a single focus, which is LDL cholesterol. So anything that increases it should be avoided, and anything that lowers it, we should embrace. Uh, but in, an adi in addition, there are several myths, and these myths are being perpetuated by doctors and dietitians alike regarding imaginary dangers to the kidneys, liver, bones, etc. This was written uh, about the last guidelines in 2015, uh, and Stephen Nissen, the, the doctor that is writing about it in 2016, he saw that a detailed review of the new guidelines, again, he's talking about the last one, uh, confirms a disturbing reality, the nearly complete absence of high-quality, randomized, controlled clinical trials studying meaningful clinical outcomes for dietary intervention. Unfortunately, the current and past U.S. dietary guidelines represent a nearly evidence-free zone. It's a strong statement, but it's true, and it seems to be true for the next one. So, he continues, we reduced dietary fats, but binged on carbohydrates and became increasingly obese. Type 2 diabetes grew into an epidemic uh, that is now threatening to reverse decades of progress in coronary heart disease incidence. The obsession with low-fat diets has resulted in some extraordinary and bizarre food marketing practices. Yes, indeed. So, why so much resistance to change? Because we know low carb is better to achieve and maintain weight loss. It is better to control type 2 diabetes. And it's an obvious dietary solution for the metabolic syndrome. So I'm going to propose to you that the biggest problem is not insulin resistance, it's evidence resistance. <laughs> A piece of the puzzle as to why this happens has to do with the many myths surrounding low carb. So let's take a look at them. Uh, it will harm your kidneys, it will ha harm your liver, it will harm your bones, and it will, it will give you gout because it raises uric acid, all that protein. I like to do an analogy uh, with heart failure and exercise. A patient that has a uh, late stage heart failure cannot tolerate uh, exercise like, for example, going two flights of stairs. He may die, okay? But that does not mean that exercise is bad for the heart. So, it is a logical fallacy. Very sick heart equals low exercise tolerance. That is true. But exercise does not cause heart disease. Likewise, very sick kidneys, they can't tolerate a high-protein diet but a high-protein diet does not cause kidney disease, okay? We are going to look at an observ observational study of patients with type 2 diabetes that are deemed to be at high risk of kidney disease. Now, we are talking about 6,000 patients followed from 2002 to 2008. In this graph, what is to the left is protective, and what is to the right is associated with a higher risk of progression to kidney disease in these patients. And I'm going to highlight animal protein, because we all have heard that animal protein is especially bad. But see, those that consumed the most animal protein were actually less likely to progress 
to kidney disease. And basically, the only two kinds of foods that were associated with a bad outcome were high carbohydrate foods and deep fried fast food, which shouldn't be a surprise because those patients are diabetic. And diabetic patients, why are they losing renal function? Because high blood sugar is affecting the kidney. Now, this is a special paper. It is special because uh, it is the only randomized control trial I could find that is actually testing a higher protein diet on patients that have already established kidney disease. The diet they were trying uh, cut carbs by half, but uh, protein was not restricted. It is a multiple intervention diet, so there is also reducing uh, iron on the diet, and they are also increasing polyphenols uh, in the diet. So it's hard to say what is actually doing good here because there it's several interventions. But uh, keep in mind, it's half the carbs, but it's liberal on the protein side. So the results are stunning. This is a 19% absolute risk reduction. So uh, keep in mind that usually when people take statins for uh, primary prevention, we are talking about at most a 1% risk reduction, 1%. This is a 19% risk reduction for dialysis or death with a diet that did the opposite of what the guidelines tells you to do. It is uh, uh, free in terms of protein, it restricts carbs, and you can see the difference. So it seems that no, not only a low-carb diet is not uh, bad for your kidneys, but it may, may be actually good in terms of reversing disease. Liver. There is a persistent myth that a low-carb diet will somehow force or harm your liver. You probably heard that. The funny thing is there is nothing in the peer review literature that even hints at that possibility. On the contrary, when you look at the animal studies, there are many, but if can, you can summarize them uh, like this. Excess sugar, fructose, in the diet leads to fat production and accumulation in the liver. Less carbs means less fatty liver. More protein also means less fatty liver. I'm going to show you just one trial, because this trial made a lot of news. So here they did a isocaloric diet and made their best effort to keep people with uh, weight stable, okay, uh, in a diet that is low carb and high protein. So according to the myth, this should be bad for your liver. It's low carb and high protein. And what we saw was a dramatic reduction of liver fat in two weeks. Okay, what about bone health? It's another ur urban legend that low carb, which is supposedly high protein, would lead to osteoporosis, and why should it? Well, one fact, and this is a physiology, physiology fact, is that what you eat does not significantly change your body pH, which is kept at a very narrow range. Now, look at this graph. It shows you that, yes, indeed, if you put people on a high-protein diet after they were on a low-protein diet, there is an in increased excretion of calcium in the urine. So people say, aha, see, when you eat more protein, you are losing calcium. And the calcium is coming from where? Obviously from the bone. Not really. Because if you look at how they absorb calcium from their diets, what people found out is that once you put someone in a high protein diet, it increases the absorption of calcium. So you become more efficient in absorbing the calcium that you are eating. And if you are absorbing more calcium, it's obvious that you're gonna excrete more. So this highlights a problem with nutrition. People extrapolate from mechanisms like, nobody cared to actually look if the calcium was coming from the bones or not. They just assumed it was from the bones. And then you have this myth that low carb is going to give you osteoporosis. Okay, what about gout? 
Gout, as you know, is very painful, it's a painful condition, and it is said to be due to much red meat and seafood. There is a myth that a low-carb diet will worsen or cause gout. Now, I went to the UK Gout Society to see what they recommend for you not to eat. You should avoid organ meats, you should avoid game, you should avoid oily fish, and seafood, and meat. So basically, you cannot eat anything that is nutrient dense. <laughs> now what should you eat instead? Plenty of fruit, at least five a day. Plenty of bread, other cereals, and potatoes, and moderate amounts of meat, fish, and alternatives. So it's the road to obesity and diabetes. It's basically that, okay? So what about science? The evidence to avoid meat is purely epidemiological. Again, nutritional epidemiology, something akin to astrology. Okay? <laughs> the great majority of purines, purines are the, uh, the things that are the precursors of the uric acid. The great majority of the purines are endogenous, meaning they are made by your body, just like cholesterol. Look at this. Dietary management of gout, what is the evidence? There were only three randomized controlled trials testing this gout diet, this low purine, high carbohydrate diet, and none have shown benefit. Now let that sink in. It's the same problem with nutrition science. People do nutrition epidemiology, then they extrapolate by mechanisms, and they never get to test if the thing actually works. Dr. Lustig showed us, again, in very detail, a lot of biochemistry, why fructose increases your uric acid. It actually needs a lot of ATP, and this A, this adenine, is a purine, so when the body needs to metabolize a lot of fructose, it will increase your endogenous production of uric acid. And this is nicely shown here. This is once you ingest sugar or high fructose corn, sugar, uh, corn uh, syrup, you have an, an acute increase in uric acid. And those things, sugar and corn syrup, they don't have any purines. They are not protein, they are not meat. Now this is an actual trial. It's a pilot study, okay, it's a small one, but look. They were doing a moderate limitation of calorie and carbohydrates and increased proportional intake of protein. So what happened? Well, basically, everybody had a reduction in their uric acid after 16 weeks. But what is more interesting, they had a huge reduction in the number of gout attacks with more protein and less carbs. Now, if we understand that a high uric acid and gout are associated with the metabolic syndrome, then this makes sense. Uh, we're starting to see uh, news like this. Could a ketogenic diet alleviate gout? So we have gone from, this certainly is bad for you and causes gout, to should we use it to treat it? So, can we fix the nutritional guidelines? Uh, Brazil has, since 2014, has the most revolutionary food guidelines in the world. Uh, instead of focusing on particular nutrients like food pyramids or my plate, uh, it's focus on processed and ultra-processed foods and the food industry. Uh, and they made these 10 steps to a healthy diet. Make natural or minimally processed foods the basis of your diet. Limit consumption of processed foods and avoid consumption of ultra-processed foods. Shopping places that offer a variety of natural or minimally processed foods and be wary of food advertising and marketing. We need to fight to break the evidence-free spell of modern nutrition. So in conclusion, low carb is not a high protein diet, but even if it were, it would not harm the kidneys. It is not a high protein diet, but even if it were, it would still be good for the liver. Low carb is not a high protein diet, but even if it were, it would be good for bone health. And low carb is not the only healthy approach to nutrition, but it should be included in the guidelines as a tool to be offered 
by healthcare providers. Thank you. Thank you.